Good morning. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for the opportunity uh, to fill in for Eric and Christy as they're out of town. We ask for a blessing on their vacation or wherever they may be. Just ask for a blessing on their travels and their time together and with their children. And they can just enjoy each other, enjoy your word, and they can fellowship while they're not here. Lord, I ask that I honor your word and that I'm able to explain it and go over it in the way it was intended. And in name, your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. I'm not Eric Hightower. If you left right now, I would not be offended. I'm filling in. Um, we're going to be covering the... Ten Commandments. Today we're, we're only going to go over the fifth commandment. Uh, gone over one through four. We'll go over, we'll review those. Uh, let me move this. You can find them in Exodus 20, verses uh, 7 through 17, I believe. I think that's actually from my previous notes. It's in Exodus 20, you'll find it. Eric Hightower, I believe he says, I trust you have your Bible. I heard another pastor say, you should have your Bible here because if you're not bringing it here, you're not taking it anywhere else. I kind of like that. I might steal that, alter it in some way. All right, so why do we follow the Ten Commandments? We'll do a quick review. First, they're universal and obligation. They're intrinsically and eternally right. There hasn't been a single document that has held up like the Ten Commandments have for the last 3,000 years. No one will ever come up with a better system than the God-based Ten Commandments. Second, they are universal in scope. They cover the whole range of worldly activity. It's uh, utopian to believe what would happen if everybody followed them, but it's not going to happen. We live in a fallen world. So, Third, they are universal in impact. We would know if we had kept these commandments by examining our hearts as well as our outward life. Does your heart desire to know God? Does it desire to carry out the, the, his deeds and his Ten Commandments? Fourth, they're universal in understanding, especially six through ten. Don't murder, don't commit adultery. It's, it's pretty simple, pretty easy to follow. They're required even with the New Covenant. I understand the Ten Commandments are in the Old Testament. Jesus has the New Testament. But he covers these in the New Testament with his new covenant. The old covenant was a blood covenant, which involved circumcision, sacrifice, etc. People came, became proud of these, and uh, Jesus came, and we have the new covenant, Matthew 5, 17 through 19. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments as teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. All right, first commandment, Exodus 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. Well, what is a false god? A false god is something that we have as an aim in life or we give thanks to. Previously, I listed a number of fal false gods that we see in society, such as education, art, politics. Your identity, is your, what is your identity in? Is it in, uh, is it in Christ or is it in your political party? It should be in Christ. Second commandment. Verses 4 through 6, paraphrased, you shall have no idols, for God is a jealous God. The definition of an idol is an image or form consecrated as an object of worship. This required further explanation, explanation from God, as Moses had to constantly remind them to remove these images from their life. In verse 5, he says, I am a jealous God. He is a jealous God. This is mentioned throughout the Bible that God is jealous and he, it is justified that he demands your exclusive attention. Continued consequences in verse 7, 
keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. This shouldn't come as any surprise that your sins could be carried on to your next generation. We see this in uh, families with parents that are violent, verbally abusive, alcoholism, that will carry on to your child's life, carried in the next generation. Third commandment, verse 7, you shall not take the Lord's, the Lord God, your God's name in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And uh, we cleared it up last time, this isn't when dad slams his finger in the car door taking the Lord's name, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about carrying the Lord's name. Do not take is a common translation, but the Hebrew word is tisa, T-I-S-A, which means to carry. So do not carry the Lord's name in vain. And it's referring to carrying it with a weight, such as a bridge with support cars that are driving over it. Do not carry the Lord's name in vain. If you're a believer, you are carrying the name of God. You must conduct yourself in a bi biblical way. Non-believers see you claim to be a Christian, so you should carry yourself in such a way. God has the most righteous name. We learned that in Matthew 6, 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's how we're taught to pray. We're taught to lead off with the righteousness of God's name. Vain, the Hebrew word is shall, like shower without the ER, which means deceit. This is an individual that has a condition with their heart. Their heart is rejecting the truth that their mind knows. And when they're carrying the name in vain, they're committing the unforgivable sin of disbelief. The Lord will not hold him guiltless. Matthew 12, 31 through 32 gives an example of who carries the name in vain. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be given, will be forgiven people but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. This is when the Pharisees were blaspheming the Spirit by which they were crediting Christ for doing miracles uh, with the power of Satan instead of crediting the Holy Spirit. All right, fourth, remember the Sabbath. What is the Sabbath and its significance? First, it's a holy day, which you are to rest from work and worship, or you're supposed to rest from work and to worship God. We have uh, four things I'd like you to remember that remember. We need to remember it's a holy day. In Exodus 16, 21 through 30, they were, had to, they were told to remember the Sabbath because they were told several times to remember the Sabbath. It wasn't mentioned just one time in the Ten, in the Ten Commandments. We're to raise it above all others. Uh, verse 8 tells us to keep it holy. Does everybody have rainbows drawn on their nose like me? I got a bunch of kids. That stuff happens. Reason, further in this commandment, the Lord is, gives us a reason. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea. God could have easily stopped with keep the Sabbath, but he explains that he rested, so it's required from us. Next, it is a day of rest, a physical and emotional rest. It's nice taking that day to spend it with your family and staying off your phone and staying out of the newspaper and all those things, uh, which can become overwhelming. I like this quote from George Brooks. It is a great privilege to be permitted to rest from exhausting toil it is a still greater privilege to be able to devote an entire day to the interest of the soul. A Sabbath right spent is a foretaste of heaven. It exalts us, exalts us into intimate communion with God and elevates the whole, whole tone of our life. So we must remember to keep it, raise it above all days, remember the reason, and to rest. Sabbath should look vastly different than the other six days of the week for you. All right, fifth commandment. Exodus 12, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord God is giving you. So this commandment and the fourth commandment of keeping the Sabbath are the only two things 
that the, command, that the commandments tell us to do. Other things are in the negative. This is in the positive. Keep the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath. Honor your father and your mother. Your father and your mother are co-creators with God. And this commandment is a bridge that relates God to his people. What's interesting about this commandment is if a child cannot honor their parents, why would they be able to honor any other authority in their life? Jesus talks about this in, uh, I'm sorry, Paul talks about this in the New Testament. Uh, Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with the promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your child to anger, but bring them up in discipline and instruction in the Lord. We're going to read about... Um, Eli in 1 Samuel here shortly. That to me is probably the, one of the better examples of honoring your parents and uh, the difference between honoring obedience and disobedience and the long-term effects of choosing to not honor. First of all, what is honor? Well, if you do a quick Google search, it's just going to state uh, honor is a high respect or great, great esteem. But a number of people can be held and high respect or great esteem and, and be honored, but that can be removed with certain actions. Honoring your parents is not something that should stop. We'll get into that later, but if you think about, uh, you know, in the banking world and if, if you follow stocks at all, everyone's heard of Enron. Uh, I'm sure the leadership board and the, the directors within that company were honored and uh, had people had great esteem for him, but their, that leadership's des desire to uh, put greed above the other people, the people that work for them, caught up with them, and overnight, the employees, the stock, everything with Enron fell out, and all honor was removed from that leadership because people lost their retirement, they lost life savings, that honor was removed. The Hebrew word is kabod, kabod, K-A-B-O-D, means to be uh, physically heavy when they use the word honor, regarding our parents as eminently worthy of a weight, so physically tons of respect. I did come across another pastor that created his own definition. It's a decision to treat your parents with digni dignity and courtesy and to provide them long-term loyalty to their best interests. It's a long-term loyalty. So parents have a God-ordained authority. There's no true authority, no true power apart from God. All authority is delegated or derived authority, and no man can have any real authority if he refused to be under God's authority. John 19, 10 through 11, So Pilate said to him, this is in Jesus' trial, So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. So God created this authority, so it was a divine authority given to the parents, and he created a hierarchy with him at the top, the parents right below him, and then the parents over the children. This commandment is perpetual. You do not have, I'm sorry, you do have to honor them for as long as they live. In 1 Timothy 5.8, Paul is instructing Timothy on how to handle widows without the church, specifically elderly widows that would not be able to remarry. In 5.8, he says, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith, faith and is worse than an unbeliever. A healthy home is the best place to train up a child, and when it comes to taking care of relatives, Children observe their parents. I've observed my parents and how they took care of their, my grandparents, their parents. Be it from afar, we lived in another location, but there's no commandment in the Bible that says you have to live on the same cul-de-sac as your parents. It's not required. A lot of times, honor's best kept up from a distance, and that's understandable. If you as a parent continue to honor your parents through your life, you are setting the example for your child. Disre disrespect and neglect of our parents will likely lead to harm. 
But what if you don't love your parents? Are you commanded to love your parents? Well, in the Old Testament, you're not. But we go back to the New Testament and the New Covenant. And this is often referred to as the New Commandment. In John 13, 34 through 35, a new commandment I give to you that you are to love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. But maybe your parents don't act honorable or they don't, you don't believe they, they deserve honor. Well, the Old Testament does not tell us to obey our parents but to honor them. The most important thing is to remember that there is one authority over your parents, and that's God. If your parents tell you to do something that violates God's will, we are to respectfully decline. The obedience to our parents is guided by the framework provided by God. So, honoring your parents and obeying them, um, if, you're, if your parents ask you to do something that is not within the, within the framework of God, you are to respect, respectfully decline. I, I like an example that Alistair Begg, I listened to a few weeks ago, and he, he gave an example of he knew, uh, I think it was a 17-year-old child, something like that, but his parents were not believers, but the child, teenager, was continuing to come to church and had accepted Christ. This is the greatest thing, right? But he wanted to be baptized. And the parents said, you are not getting baptized. His salvation is not dependent upon this public display of him being baptized. So he believes, Alistair Begg said this, I believe in the same situation you were to honor your parents. Don't get baptized, that's fine. You've accepted Christ in your life. When you become an adult and you move on, you can go through with this outward expression. It's a wonderful thing, but you are commanded to, to uh, honor your parents. So what if you choose to not honor your parents? Well, the essence of sin is rebellion against God, the one with the ultimate authority. If there is one way to summarize a heart that does not pursue God, it would be the rejection of God's authority. Exodus 21, 15 and 17, whoever strikes his father or his mother shall be put to death. Whoever curses his mother or his father shall be put to death. God is stating that those who do this are cursing the divine authority that he has given his parents. If you are cursing them, you are cursing God. Now the penalty no longer remains. There's, there's no example within the Old Testament where a child was put to death for not honoring their parents. But God states it in such a way so you can understand uh, the severity of it. So where can we see this in the Bible? Like I said earlier, in 1 Samuel, uh, Eli was a, a, a widely respected judge for over 40 years in Israel. And he had two sons that were priests. And his sons chose to not honor him. Their dishonor was filled with lying, theft, fornication, to list a few. And they're described in 1 Samuel 2.12 as the sons of Eli were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord or their duties as the priests. And it is not on just Eli's sons for this. Eli, as it says in 1 Samuel, did not take any liberty in disciplining his children. So they would have no reason to honor him. He was just a fellow uh, judge, priest, someone that they lived with. He was not treating them as a parent should. So we'll read this in 20, 1 Samuel 2, 22 through 25. Now Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all of Israel, and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent to the meeting. And he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. Now, my sons, it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord... Who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. The structure of authority has been given to us from God, and it's as follows. You have your family authority, your parents. God's established this in such a way that husbands have authority over their wives, and the parents have authority over the children. Then you have your spiritual authority, which is the church. 
right? So in the church, the pastor's limited. The pastor is limited to issues of life in their respective church. Then you have state. This is a civil authority, uh, state, county, whatever you want to chalk it up to, the different, but specific regions and countries. God establishes this in Romans 13, 1 through 2. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath and the wrongdoer. Now we're going to get on to the promise that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. This is the only ten commandment that prom- ten, or the only of the ten commands that promises a reward. But we should not read it that the individual who honors their parents and their father and their, their, their father and their mother will live long in the land, but it's their nation that will prosper. Think of civilization that was to honor their parents and understand proper authority and have respect for authority and those hierarchies. The well-being of a nation is supported by a home. I was told this story a few years ago by a gentleman who escaped Cuba during the Batista regime and he, you know, still had family and friends, etc. as he lived his life in the States. And he told me a story about when uh, Castro took over and Castro would send uh, soldiers into elementaries and junior highs, but specifically elementaries to very young children. And the soldiers would become friends with the children. And he would have them, at their initial meetings, he would have them pray to God, uh, put their heads down on their desk and pray to God and ask God for candy. And uh, they would open their, lift their heads up, open their eyes, and there wouldn't be any candy. And then he would say, now bow your heads, close your eyes, and pray to Castro for candy. And then the soldiers would put candy on the desk. So when they opened their eyes, they thought Castro provided for them. This would shift the loyalty of the small child from their parents to that of the state. Then the soldiers would then ask the children, if your parents happen to say anything against Castro, someone who provides for you, would you please let us know so we can just go talk to your parents and see what's going on? Little did they know that the six-year-old was getting their parents arrested. We see these kinds of things within Nazi regimes in the past, and you see it every day in radical Islam. Honoring of the parents and understanding that this hierarchy will help to eradicate this. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But understand this, that in the last days will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. Right in the middle of it, it says disobedient to their parents. And this is telling us what it's going to be like in the end times. In the, in the verse, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, we read this, and this is, this is summarizing Eli's sons. They loved pleasure more than they loved God. The desire for worldly, worldly pleasure was greater than that of honoring their father. So we'll go back to 1 Samuel 2, 22, or 27 through 33. And there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, did I indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when, when they were in Egypt subject to the house of Pharaoh? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest? I go up to my altar to burn incense to wear an ephod before me. I gave to the house of your father all my offerings by fire from people of Israel. Why then do you scorn my, sac- scorn my sacrifices and offerings that I command, commanded for my dwelling? 
And honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of, of every offering of my people of Israel. Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promise that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me, before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me, those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I cut off your strength, and the strength of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. Then in distress you will look with envious eyes on all the prosperity that shall be bestowed on Israel, and there, sh there shall not be an old man in your house forever. The only, one, the only one of you whom I shall not cut off from my altar shall be spared to weep his eyes out to grieve his heart, and the descendants of your house shall die by the swords of men." This is a summary and the impact of choosing to not honor your parents and the parents not acting in, acting in an honorable way, disciplining and teaching their children respect. God allowed Eli's sons to die as a result of their actions, and Eli's family would not grow old. When I started th studying this commandment, I often thought about how my parents were raised. My mom was one of 13, my dad was one of I think five or six, something like that. And my dad did not live in a, when he was raised, a traditional household. He was raised by his grandmother for an extended period. Then he lived with his uh, mom and stepdad until he graduated. And I never really heard a positive thing about his childhood other than regarding his grandmother, my great-grandmother, Leela. And... It's, it's interesting looking back, even though he was not raised in a loving home by his parents, he still chose to honor his mother and his, his, his father, his stepdad, but he chose to honor him from a distance, like I was saying. We were not going to live in the same town that he was raised in with his, his parents. But the, the way I see it was, you know, we would, we would be leaving his the feed yard that he ran and I worked for him and my siblings we'd be in a single cab truck and this was you know 97 through 99 around there and he had a built-in car phone which is a big deal at that point in time and he had a little microphone up here that you had to shout across him to speak into and we'd be driving home we'd be tired and then he would start dialing somebody and we'd say who are you calling he wouldn't say a word <laughs> because we weren't ever terribly excited for who he was calling he would start dialing, and then my grandma would answer, and he'd say, talk to her. We'd be like, oh, <laughs> now we've got to talk to her. Hi, Grandma, and we've got to go through all this stuff. And he went through the motions. She was excited to talk to us. Um, but then we would run out of things to talk about. You know, I mean, we didn't want to tell her how, I didn't want to tell her how I was failing math and got progress reports and was sent to the principal's office. This isn't a terribly exciting thing to tell your grandmother. So... You know, we're, we're getting off the phone, and he'd say, all right, Grandma, well, we're, we're pulling up wherever it was. Uh, we'll, we'll call you later, and then he would hang up. She got a phone call. She knew that somebody loved her. Uh, she wasn't left alone, and he wasn't having to sit there, listen to his mom, criticize him, which was a common thing for her. I see that you, you can see this fading in culture of not honoring parents. Just so wrote down a couple examples. How do you address your parents? Um, you calling them mom and dad, or are you saying you calling them your old man, or whatever it may be? Are you treating them with respect? Are you choosing to honor them? Do you slander them? Slander them? I have something I'm going to read here in a second about slandering. Slandering is unbelievably common, be it through gossip or you slander them to their face. Small children that argue with their parents and then the parents cave. I was at Walgreens the other day grabbing something and there was a little four-year-old boy screaming at his mom because Walgreens didn't have the right selection of ice cream. And then he started yelling, I want Buddy Bucks and ice cream. Buddy Bucks are at HEB and the mom said, we don't have time. And he screamed, I want Buddy Bucks and whatever ice cream that he wanted that Walgreens didn't seem to have or seemed to be good enough for him. So she said, fine, we'll go to H-E-B. Who's in charge? Four years old, who's in charge? 
That's Eli's sons. She's raising them up. The promise of living long in land is removed when we dis- disrespect leadership such as police and those other hierarchies. Our children disrespect their teachers. These societies start to lean towards anarchy. I'd like to just finish with this paragraph from one of Charles Spurgeon's uh, sermons. I don't know, this, this was delivered in 1878. Spurgeon died in 1892 at 57, but he was the New Park Street, he was the pastor, Baptist preacher, I'm sorry, Baptist preacher of the New Park Street Chapel in London for 38 years. But perhaps our children, I'm sorry, but our children perhaps do not give us most anxiety when they are infants, nor when we have them at school, when we put them to bed and give them a good night's kiss and feel that all is safe. The heavy care comes afterward. Afterwards, when they have broken through our control, when they are running alone and on their own account, when they are away from our home, when they are out out of the reach of our rebuke, and do not now feel as once they did the power of our authority and hardly of our love. It is then to many parents that the time of severe trial begins, and doubtless, Many a gray head has been brought with sorrow to the grave by having to cry, I have nourished and brought up my children, and they have rebelled against me. Many in a father, many a father and many a mother die, murdered, not by the knife or by poison, but by unkind words and cruel deeds of their own children. Many and many a grave may well be watered by the tears of sons and daughters because they prematurely fill those graves by their ungrateful conduct. Let's pray. Lord God, I ask that you remind us to honor our parents, whether they're living or deceased. You gave us our parents to provide for us, to nurture us, and to guide us into a life of worshiping you. If our love has been lost, we ask you to restore it. If we cannot see how we can honor them, we ask that you provide the desire. Lord, one day our our parents will need us, That day may be today. We ask for the desire to obey your command. Lord, give us the wisdom and the means to carry out this command. In your name we pray. Amen.